One of the very important IFRS that is frequently examined in the paper is the IFRS number 5, non-current asset held for sale and discontinued operations. So what do I mean by non-current asset is what I mean by, for example, the PP&E, intangible asset investment property, but instead of using it continuously in the business, the business decides to sell it, so which means holding it for sale purposes. So therefore, held for sale does not equal that we've already sold that PP&E, but we are holding it for sale. So in other words, we are not using it any longer, but we are holding it for sale purposes. And also, what do I mean by discontinued operations is, first of all, you need to meet with the condition number one. So the asset that you're currently using would not be used by the business any longer, but you are holding it for sale purposes, so for health for sale. Alternatively, you have already sold that PP&A to somebody else, and that would be the first criteria. The second condition is one of the three situations needs to be met. So, for example, if the subsidiary that you are currently holding is held for sale, and that subsidiary stands for a separate major line of your business. So, for example, if you're selling uh, glasses, if you're selling mouse and selling uh, computers, and you decide to hold your computer production line for sale and that stands for a separate major line of your business and that's second condition. Alternatively, if you're selling the computer uh, product line, so the mouse could be affected and affected is what I mean by part of a coordinated plan uh, would be another situation here. So if you acquire the subsidiary but for resale, so you decide to buy the subsidiary but you aim to resell it very quickly to somebody else and this is the second condition met. If both conditions are met, what you need to do is it qualifies the, dis, uh, the discontinued operation. If it qualifies the discontinued operation, is only for the disclosure requirement rather than booking it into the account. So what you need to do is to separately present that p and of the discontinued operations uh, in, the statement of, in, in the statement of profit or loss. Uh, and also the, for discontinued operations, including the operating, investing and financing cash flows altogether, you're going to present them separately into the statement of cash flow, and that's all you can do. And of course, in the PL, you also need to compute or to calculate the earnings per share as well. So, um, if you're selling or decide to sell the not just one piece of PPE, but uh, grouping the PPE and the intangibles all together, and this is what I'm, this is what I mean by disposal group. Uh, so sometimes we, we can use another name for that, it's, it's the cash generating unit, but for a cash generating unit, it's for impairment review test purposes, but disposal group is just to be uh, a few items of asset grouping all together, we aim to resell it to something else. But from the exam's point of view, you need to tell the examiner how can you recognize or how you can identify that this will be a non current asset held for sale. The initial classification will really depend on these two circumstances or these two criteria. So first of all, whether or not it's probable that it can complete the sale and secondly, whether or not it's available for immediate sale. So to confirm whether or not it's probable is you can sell the asset quickly, it really depends on certain indicators or certain evidence from the auditor's point of view, we need to watch out for. First of all, is there an evidence that the business is locating a buyer very actively? So usually we can check the advertisement placed by the agency. If you were to sell a piece of building, so usually you need to engage with the uh, 
the third party agency to sell on your behalf. So you need to check that sale plan as well as the advertisement. But also you need to determine whether or not the price is quite fair that you put on sale. So in other words, similar competitors are selling the same, uh, very similar building at $1 million, but you are selling at $1 billion. If this is the case then, although you put that into the put that through to the third party agency who sell on your behalf, but actually it may be very difficult for you to complete the sale because the price is too high. So you also need to confirm that whether or not it could be completed in one year to complete the entire sale. Uh, so it's very, very important though. So because if you were to classify this as the non-current asset held for sale, that would be as the current asset, because that would be a current asset that should be an asset within one year. And of course, in some circumstances, that if I were to sell the building, but uh, due to a global pandemic or other unexpected situations, so sometimes it is allowed to extend that deadline a bit further. So for example, more than one year, and this could be fine, but generally, it should be less than one year. Third, whether or not you've got the shareholders' approval to sell that piece of uh, building uh, or, or some of the major asset, and that's very, very important because if you haven't got any approvals at all, you need to look at the resolution from the uh, meeting, from the general meeting as well as the board meeting, and from the auditor's point of view, you need to check them. Okay, to confirm the probability of the sale. So probability of a sale depends on whether or not you're located by actively, completes the sale within one year, you've got the approval. So three criteria, you need to look out, look for evidence associated with them. Second, whether or not it's available for immediate sale, and that's very important. So for example, you've got a building here, you decide to sell it, but if others are buying it, and if others are buying it and you said, okay, you need to wait for another six months before we wait, uh, vacant the building. If this is the case then, during that six months, you cannot recognize as the non-current asset held for sale. But only after the six months is passed by, you can recognize as the non-current asset held for sale. So it should be immediate sale if others want it, signs the contract and you can deliver that immediately. And if this is the case then, yes, you can recognize as the non-current asset held for sale. If you recognize it as the non-current asset held for sale, all you can do is to de-recognize the non-current asset, so irrespective of PP&E or intangibles or the investment property, you credit it. But how about for a debit? For a debit, what you need to do is to debit the non-current asset held for sale and the value should be the lower of the current value of the existing PPNE or the intangible and the fair value minus cost of disposal for prudence reason. So some businesses may in practice may decide to reclassify the PPNE into a non-current asset health for sale to boost its current ratio in order to get money from the bank or to borrow some money from the bank. And therefore, according to, according to the prudence reason, we cannot allow the business to overstate its current asset to boost the current ratio. And this is why we've got a regulation here. And the balancing figure, of course, we put that into the p and as the impairment because it makes sense. The reason why you're going to sell the asset is because the asset is not performing and therefore, recognise the impairment losses would be quite sensible. How about for subsequent measurement? <coughs> for a subsequent measurement, same as what we've seen in the investment property carried at, at a <coughs> fair value model, there should not be any subsequent depreciation related to a non-current asset held for sale any longer because that does not relate to PP&E and that relates to the current asset. Any subsequent impairment losses, we still need to charge that. Okay, so if you find out that a non-current asset is subject to further impairments, 
we still need to recognize that losses, uh, uh, that loss of the impairment. If we cease to recognize the non current asset as the health for sale, so all we can do is to remove to reduce the non current asset health for sale and to increase the PP and E up and to <coughs> make sure the balancing figure is reversed. But if it's more than one year to be the non current asset health for sale, so subsequently, from the auditor's point of view, we need to see whether or not you put in additional effort to sell that <coughs> building. If you're not putting additional effort in selling that building, <coughs> we, we, we cannot prove that the, it's more than one year, it still be a non current asset health for sale. So I would say it's not a non current asset health for sale any longer. It needs to be seized to recognize as the health for sale. But if you're putting additional effort, so for example, you're engaging an other expert, you've got a new staff coming in and to sell the building on the business behalf, and you pay for that fee and so on, you increase that cost. So you're going to put the additional expenditure that you've incurred in order to complete the sale if it is greater than one year as the finance costs and to credit the non current asset health for sale. And that's all you can do. But from my perspective, though, very importantly from the exam's point of view is the classification criteria. So the exam question uh, usually will not complicate the scenario. Um, this is why what you need to do is to make sure they understand the criteria in that so before you can apply that into the case. Another IFAS we're going to recap on is the IFAS 8 operating segment. This only uh, to the public listed companies and if they have different product lines or the geographical areas so it, what they need to do is to disclose them separately. So a business needs to identify the segments. So for example, different business activities that it has. Uh, for example, the marketing activity, and we've got a sales activity to sell the pen, for example. There'll be a separate person. So uh, usually it's called the chief operating decision maker to review that information. And for each segment, there'll be separate financial information ready and if this is the case then, we've got a segment. We've got a segment, we don't need to report that unless it meets with the 10% criteria. So for example, if you're having a product line selling pen and uh, the total asset or total income accounts for more than 10% of the group's ones. If this is the case then, that segment is reportable. If it is reportable, we need to disclose that separately. If it decides to report that separately, you also need to meet with the 75 principle as well. So, which means you're going to bring all other segments that are not uh, meeting with the 10% criteria. So, for example, some segments will only account for 2% of the income. So, uh, one of that will be accounting for 1% of the income. You're going to plot them all together. You need to disclose at least. 75% of the total income of those segments altogether. That's 75% principle there in, in, in there. So you need to uh, fulfill that criteria. For the disclosure, you need to disclose different product services or the locations of different segments. But for similar products lines, they can combine all together. But uh, there will be certain rules in there. So for example, if you're selling similar products with the similar customer base. So for example, you're targeting men, targeting women, targeting businessmen, and so on. Yes, you can group them all together. Uh, but uh, there'll be strict rules that should be applied. Central costs, okay, incurred in the group. So for example, we've got the management charge, we've got the CEO's salaries, wages, and so on. So how are we gonna allocate into different segment and that really depends on uh, your subjective judgment. So depending on how many people are there in each of the segments, you can base your allocation based on the number of staff that you have, based on the value of pp and es that you have, and so on. So uh, there will be no criteria or the no uh, 
strict regulation on this particular issue, or the, on, on the central cost issue under the IFRS number 8, and you need to justify that in your accounting policy, and this could be fine, okay? So that's all you can do. The next area that we're going to recap on is the IFRS 9 financial instrument. So very, very tough and complicated accounting standards with a separate IAPN or the International Auditing Practice Note, a thousand for the special considerations related to financial instruments. From the auditor's point of view, we need to be ready for that. So for the financial instrument is where we've got a contract, that contract can be converted into money form, and that's what I mean by financial instrument. So examples could be cash, buying other debts, buying the equity, which means the investment in debt to the equity, receivables or payables, or options, future swaps and forward contracts. These are derivative, and these are financial instruments. So, the first question we need, we need to tackle is how we're going to classify that financial instrument into the liability or equity. Because to the financial asset is quite straightforward. Because the financial instrument is a financial asset if it gives benefit to one party. So, for example, we've got a receivable, and that certainly be the financial asset. Because using that contract, we can get the money back from the counterparty, and that would be a financial asset. But how to recognise it as the financial liability or equity from the counterparty's point of view? Well, that really depends on whether or not the counterparty would have an obligation to settle the transaction. Alternatively, if it is for equity instruments, whether or not for the counterparty uh, it has uh, the choice to give dividend to others, and this is how we classify that. But in practice, that's more complicated. So the rule here is really depends on the total value. If the total value is fixed, in other words, we owe you money, so we need to pay for you that amount of money, because that money is fixed, and that would be a financial liability. If the value is not fixed, so for example, we we'll repay the money to you. We are not repaying how much. We are repaying the fixed amount, number of shares to you. But at what price? Because we are repaying that money to you, we need to issue uh, the additional shares. But at what price? Well, that is not defined. That is not fixed. Although the number of shares that I'm going to issue and repay back to you is fixed, but the total value is not fixed. And therefore, this obligation, we cannot carry it as the financial liability, but only carry this as the equity instrument. Second, any gains or losses, usually we put that into the P&L. So for example, for dividend income received, dividend income received, interest income received, we put that into the P&L. But for dividend paid, we're going to reduce the retained earnings, and that's all we can do. For disposal of the financial instrument, same as what we've seen, in the disposal of the uh, biological asset or the PPE, we put that into the PO. Okay, that's all we can do. And for the transaction costs, then, if I were to incur the transaction costs related to a financial instrument, if the financial instrument is carried at fair value, the transaction costs, we put that into the PO. So otherwise, we're going to capitalize it as part of the financial instrument value. But how about for a convertible bond? So, I mean, if you are buying the bond, it is the financial asset. If you're issuing, which means we're going to sell that bond here, of how we're going to regulate this. If you are issuing the convertible bond, at the time the issue, we receive cash, and we're going to put that into a liability, as well as part of the equity into reserve. So, for example, uh, if I were to issue the convertible bond, so during that period, so for example, let's say five years, we need to pay the interest at the end of the fifth year, we need to pay the redemption value worth of, let's say, $1,000 back to the buyer. If this is the case, then we're going to discount all those future cash flows into the liability. We put that into the liability, let's say 970 We receive $1,000 cash, and therefore, 
the $30 we put up as the reserve into the SFP. For subsequent measurements, all we can do is for the liability, we account for the finance costs each and every year. So we simply debit the finance costs and to credit the financial liability each and every year. And of course, when we repay that money, so which means at the time of redemption, so we simply reduce that liability and to reduce the cash paid, and that's all you can do. And of course, if you are not deciding to pay cash at the end of the fifth year, because the buyer uh, chooses to redeem the convertible bond into shares, so the issuer needs to issue additional shares to repay that. And issuing shares, what we should do is to reduce the reserve that we recognised before, but to put that into ordinary share capital as well as the share premium. But please do remember that the share capital will only be increased by the amount of par value, okay, according to the par value. So usually it will be $1 each. With the, uh, with the additional amount going into the share premium. And how about for the recognition of financial instruments, which means we're going to sell it, okay, or we collect it, the money from the financial assets, or repay it as the financial liability, we'll repay that money, so we're going to get rid of that, that's all we can do. So credit financial assets and to debit financial liability. But how about for the investment point of view, so, which means we are standing from a buyer's point of view. We buy shares, which means investment in equity instrument. If we buy other company's shares is for trading purposes, uh, so what we can do is that the fair value changes, we directly put that into the P&O. And for transaction costs associated with that, again, we put that into the P&O as well. But if you're buying other shares, it's for strategic purposes. So in other words, we're buying shares, it's for long-term holding purposes. So the fair value changes, we put that into OCI or other comprehensive income. So uh, in other words, we buy other company shares at $50, but now the share price reaches to 80. The $30 gain, we debit financial assets of 30 and credit OCI of 30. And we accumulate that into reserve, into SFP. Any transaction cost incurred, so we're going to capitalise it into the financial asset. We simply debit financial asset worth of, let's say, $2 of the transaction costs and to credit bank. How about for the investment in debt? So we're buying others' debt, so which means we are lending money to others. So it really depends on if you're buying debt, if it is for short-term trading purposes, you buy at low price, expecting to resell it at a higher price, if this is the case then, again, fair value through P&O. So in other words, fair value changes <coughs> directly into the P&O. Associated transaction costs, again, into the P&O. <coughs> On the other hand, if you are buying others' debt, you decide to hold it to maturity. And the cash flows that you can receive will only be the interest and the principal, or the amount of uh, money, redemption monies that you can receive. So you're going to carry this at amortised cost. Okay? So amortised cost simply means we're going to recognise the finance, finance income each and every year. Sometimes a business may have no idea of whether or not to short-term trade it or to hold it to maturity. But the cash flows would only include interest and the principal, and if this is the case then, we put that into OCI, because we're not particularly sure your intention for that. To confirm this from the uh, auditor's point of view, we need to check the management remuneration. So for example, if the management is remunerated based on the fair value changes, and of course, it could either be the for trading purposes or into the OCI. But uh, if, uh, Management is remunerated based on the amount of money that you can collect it at the end of the life of the financial assets. If this is the case, then I can conclude that 9 out of 10, this could be held to maturity. So we need to look at the company's policy as well as the management's remuneration to determine the practice that the management has to determine 
in what category that the investment in that instrument should be recognized to. For the financial liability, on the other hand, <coughs> if you're borrowing some money from others, if it's not for trading purposes, of course, uh, 9 out of 10, this would be the case using amortized cost method and to recognize the financial costs. But if it is for trading purposes, so for example, if you issue financial liability, but that subsequently can be negotiable, which means uh, it can be transferred into others. Uh, so usually we can see the derivative here and for any futures, contract and so on, because you can immediately resell it into the uh, financial market, you can settle the transaction. And if this is the case then, if it is for trading purposes, we need to calculate the fair value changes directly put that into the PL or the fair value through PL if you like. So now let's see the audit procedures related to financial instruments. So the IAPN or the International Auditing Practice Note or IAPN 1000 is in your syllabus. First of all, from the auditor's point of view, <coughs> we need to admit that most of financial instruments will be the high audit risky areas. Uh, <coughs> why this would be, be the case is because the market conditions will change and therefore the value of the financial instrument will change. And putting pressure to management to uh, make sure the profit figure look better. And there will be very complicated accounting as well as the disclosure requirements. The disclosure requirements will be according to the IFRS number 7, Disclosure of Financial Instrument. In terms of uh, its, the significance of the risk and uh, also for the qualitative and quantitative part as well. And therefore, we need to remain professional skepticism throughout auditing the financial instruments. That's very, very important. So the response <coughs> developed by the auditor, uh, in general, we need to remain professionally skeptical. So we need to check that item very carefully. In terms of the planning as well as the uh, procedure stage, so we need to watch out. At the planning stage, we need to understand certain matters First of all, what will be the disclosure as well as the accounting requirements and the purposes that you're holding the financial instrument. So sometimes it's only for speculation. Speculation, in other words, we are buying or selling or the, the futures contract. So without any <coughs> uh, items in the cash market. So, so for example, we are, uh, so for example, if you have uh, the, if you have a mine, so you sell mines and therefore at the same time you're going to short the mines futures contract and of course the, if the the price of the mine subsequently falls um, the in the cash market you sell less you make a loss but in the futures market you gamble it right because you're shorting it and the price falls you make a gain so you offset against each other and this is what i mean by hedge but if it is only for speculation purposes, so in other words, you're shorting the mines, but without selling the mines in the cash market at all, and therefore it's only for speculation purposes. So if it is for speculation purposes, all you need to do is you're going to put the gains and losses directly into the PL. It's not the hedge accounting. But hedge accounting, on the other hand, it really depends on whether or not this would be the um, fair value hedge or cash flow hedge. And for the fair value hedge, uh, you're going to put the gains and losses from both sides into the cash market and the futures market directly into the PL to offset against each other. But for the cash flows hedge, on the other hand, uh, we're going to accumulate that into the OCI. Okay? So accumulating it into the effective proportion into the OCI, but ineffective one into the PL. But until the cash market actually took place, you're going to book that transaction. So in other words, you don't really need to know into that much detail, but you need to know the purpose of holding the financial instrument. These will be the matters to be considered for financial instrument. Third, you need to check the client's internal control, okay, as well as the internal audit department. 
and to make sure the disclosure made by the client regarding the financial instrument as well as the accounting entries are correct in some way. So I would say that uh, one of the issues or one of the news happened uh, in China is for a company uh, that is selling pigs, okay, selling pigs, and selling pigs, and that company uses the futures contract to, uh, to hedge against the price changes of that pig, and uh, inside that company, one of the staff can enter into very high value of the futures contract, and letting the company bear a lot of losses in that particular year, and Subsequently, that staff was sued by the company for those losses. But, of course, the staff cannot compensate for the losses that a company has made in the first place anyway. I would say that the uh, internal control inside that company is relatively weak. And therefore, from the auditor's point of view, we need to know, okay, you do the accounting right, and you do this right, but... Will that staff, or one particular staff, be responsible for this? And they can simply enter into multiple transactions because you know that if it is only for speculation purposes, of course, the company could easily bear into a lot of losses in there. So that's why we need to be very careful on that particular issue. And also, we need to see where not the client has outsourced the uh, financial instrument managing function or accounting to any service organization or any given third parties, uh, we need to see their internal control procedure as well. How to check it? All the procedures could be divided into general as well as the specific procedures. For general procedure, we need to see whether or not you enter into a transaction, so we're going to agree the investment cost to cash book and to see whether or not you spend the money out. And to inspect reconciliation with the entity's own record. So for example, so usually in the futures contract, because I'm trading futures as well, if you look at the futures contract, it's using a mark-to-market approach. And therefore, the price changes, especially uh, as the record from the stock exchange, uh, from the, the futures exchange, will be quite different from your record. And make sure you're going to perform the reconciliations in there. I would say 9 out of 10, it will not contain any errors. But sometimes, due to the timing differences, it may, con uh, it may include, for example, errors, or it may include certain transactions not appearing in the futures uh, record in, in a futures exchange record and that's why we need to inspect the reconciliations between these two. And we also need to inspect the accounting entries made by the client as well as the disclosure requirements to confirm they're in line with IFRS. So make sure for each procedure you need to include three parts, how you're going to do it, what to check and why. So three general procedures will be three easy marks that you can gain in your exam. But how about for specific procedures then? Of course, you need to check the accounting estimate. Very important, though, accounting estimate. Uh, so in other words, you are saying that we buy this company shares is simply because we decide to hold it for strategic purposes. And you need to inquire with the management uh, why this will be the case, what will be the logic behind it, okay? And to ensure that this is in line with the IFRS 13, so in terms of what values they're going to put uh, into your financial instrument, and that's very, very important. So, for example, uh, you are asking the management, okay, uh, this will be a type of share, and you're going to check that P ratio, but if the management is using the PB ratio and to value that... Uh, financial instrument valuing the shares, uh, this could be fine, yes, this could be fine, because if the company share is not uh, in the traditional industry, so for example in the banking industry, and using the price to book ratio could work, and therefore we need to inquire with the management, especially you're buying 
the company shares, the company is not a listed company, for example. And also you're going to develop a point estimate, which means the price, okay, what price, what specific price of that particular instrument or a range of prices uh, to see the financial instrument value uh, and to assess the management's point estimate. So, for example, uh, if management says that this is worth $100, but according to our price range, I, I, I would say uh, from 80 up to 200 will be fine. Uh, this could be fine, okay? So we're going to develop a point estimate or range to assess it. Third, we're going to determine whether or not events occurring up to the date of audit report, providing evidence regarding the accounting estimate, especially for receivables. So if the management has receivables worth of, let's say, $1 million, uh, but for a subsequent event or the events after the reporting period, or which means after the year end, that the client has gone bankrupt. If the client has gone bankrupt, there would be impairment indicator that needs to write down the receivables to a certain extent. So we're going to determine whether or not there are any news related to that as a subsequent event adjustment that we need to be ready. So if you are ready for the financial instruments, that's very good news. And I look forward to seeing you in the next of our recording then. Bye. APC, accounting for your future.